You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. What marriages need today is leadership. They need leadership. The family needs godly leadership. Too many men today have resigned to leave the leadership uh, to their wives. And so men today need to take a lead. They need to bring their marriages to godliness. And, and from time to time, you know, you hear people say, especially, of course, during an election year, you know, what we need is we need a Christian president. What a, what a difference it would make. If only we had a strong Christian in the White House. I say, if, if only we had strong Christians, men in every house. In today's message, Pastor Ron challenges the men in Christian families. For some time now, husbands have shifted their roles of leadership to their wives. And let's be clear, strong women aren't the problem. The issue is an imbalance in the marriage. The Bible is clear on the roles of husbands and wives, and somehow couples have lost this. That's why today you'll learn that there are boundaries in a biblical marriage that must be upheld. And it all starts with Jesus Christ at the center of your relationship. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Colossians chapter 3 with today's edition of Large Than Life. So turning to Colossians 3, of course, we're moving all the way through the book of Colossians, but we've kind of slowed it down here as we're uh, in a series we've entitled Lasting Relationships. Paul is talking about the importance of, of marriage and family. And of course, no one has to tell us today that marriages are under attack and a lot of marriages are hurting. And so much of that is due to, well, selfishness. Uh, too many couples today uh, really maintain their vehicles and their homes better than they do their own marriages. And, and we as Christians ought to be and need to be different. We need to nurture. We need to maintain our marriages as God intended. Now, most of you are familiar with the second law of thermodynamics. That's a big word that basically, essentially, it's a principle that we know of that if, if energy isn't expended on a, a fixed or a closed system, it'll eventually fall apart. In other words, it takes time and energy to keep things functioning as they ought to. In our own homes, those of us who are homeowners, we know that we've got to constantly be fixing them, keep maintaining them. If we don't, if we don't invest regular time and energy, it begins to fall apart, begins to break apart. And of course, if we did nothing to it, it eventually would just cease to exist. And so the same is true in a marriage. I mean, the fact is we have to expend time and energy in it. If no energy is expended in our marriage, then it's no surprise that over a period of time, you may wind up in my office or worse than that, catastrophe in a courtroom. And of course, it happens so often. So it's a wise couple. It's a wise couple that seeks to not sit back passively, but proactively is working on their marriage relationship. And let me also say this, which we established that last week. We can't do it on our own. We simply cannot. We need the help of God. We need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. In Zechariah 4, 6, it says, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And then Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. So we need God's help. Now, of course, we go back to the first marriage all the way back in, in Genesis chapter 2. It was wonderful. Uh, they, Adam and Eve lived in harmony. You know, uh, when God created Eve, you know, God made Adam out of the dust of the earth, but made Eve out of the rib. And when Adam first saw this beautiful, gorgeous woman, he went, wow, that's bone of my bone. That's flesh of my flesh. And I, I think that he said that. It tells us that in God's word. I also think he went, wow, God, all right. That is awesome. I've seen a lot of your creation, but that's the best, you know. And, and he enjoyed her, and she enjoyed him, and it was that design for uh, the wife to submit to her husband, as we saw last week, and as we're going to see today, for husbands to unconditionally love their wives. But Satan tempted them to sin, and the marriage has been a struggle ever since then to maintain. In fact, as we saw all the way last week from the very beginning, the battle of the sexes taking place at the fall, at the curse. Remember, God said to Eve in Genesis 3, 16, your desire will be for your husband and he's going to rule over you. And we saw that those two terms is the fact is she's now going to want to control the man and the man's going to want to dominate over her. So that attack on marriage. But let me also add this, that from the very beginning, not only was the marriage under attack, but really the whole family. In fact, you only have to go as far as Genesis chapter four and verse eight and you have the first murder. And it's brother against brother, Cain killing Abel. 
And then you go to Genesis 4 and verse 23 and have another distortion of marriage. We read that Lamech said to his wives, plural, Ada and Zillah. So he had a problem. He had wives from A to Z, first polygamous. <laughs> then you go to Genesis 16 and you have Abraham committing adultery, going into his wife Sarah's maid. Genesis 19, you have homosexuality and God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 38, you have prostitution and incest with Judah and Tamar. So you don't even get through the first book in the Bible and you have every form of sexual perversion, all of which is a direct attack against the marriage and the family. So the point is this, it's hard enough. It's hard enough to make a marriage work under the curse of sin but then you add on that the society we're living in today that heralds sexual perversity and immorality. So the task before us today is not an easy one. But know this, Jesus is in the business of reversing the curse. And so as I mentioned last week, and again I mentioned it today, if your marriage is, you're ready to throw in the towel, then take, take comfort knowing that Christ is in the business of doing miracles. Or if you need a refresher course, so you think you're doing great, well, there's always room for improvement. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, with men it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So when I study passages like this, I take such hope. And then there's a great verse in Ecclesiastes 4.12. We use it a lot in our marriage course. And it says, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And that's when you have the husband and the wife and Jesus Christ right in the center. Then you can have a strong union. Again, without Christ in your marriage, you can have a, a physical union. You can have an external union. But when times get difficult and tough, without Christ in the center of the marriage, then you know what happens is marriage vows become more like uh, till looks do us part. You know, you get a little old, I think I'll get myself a new model, you know or until feelings do us part, or until debt do us part, instead of until death do us part. Without Christ, there's little or no commitment. So we need Christ in the center, and that's what we're seeking to do over the next few weeks. So we find ourselves in the middle of this uh, series here, and today we are going to be looking at the role of the husband. Just one verse, although we'll turn some other passages. In verse 19 of Colossians 3, we read, Husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter towards them. Love them. There was a man walking along the shores of Southern California Beach, and uh, he saw something there, a bronze object lying in the sand. He picked it up and dusted it off, and all of a sudden, out came a genie. And the genie said, Ah, oh, master, you have one wish. The guy said, Hey, what happened to three wishes? Well, first of all, the economy. Times are tough. Just one. All right. Take one wish. Here's the deal. I, I'm afraid of flying, and I, so I've never been able to go to Hawaii. But what I'd like you to do is build a highway from Southern California all the way to the middle of the Pacific so I can go to Hawaii. And the genie said, you know, come on, give me a break. The, do you realize the logistics of doing that? That's ridiculous. I cannot do that. You, you need to come up with another wish. The man thought of it for a moment and said, uh, okay, I, I think I have it now. Um, I do not understand women at all, especially my wife. I wish that from this moment on, I will be able to understand women. The genie said, so you want that highway with two lanes or four? <laughs> I mean, I honestly wish that I could stand here today and tell you everything there is to know about women and, and, and a wife. Um, you know what? I don't. And, and therein lies the challenge. Here's something I've learned in 26 years of marriage, and that is the fact that God has made every single woman unique. And the challenge, and at the same time, the adventure for you men is to understand that woman that God has given you. It is a challenge. It is an adventure. But let me say this. There is one ar overarching mandate that God has given us that we can impart to our wives, and it's found right here, husbands, love your wives. Now, we'll talk about that in a moment, but I just want to look at this word husbands. That word husband here, the ancient word means to cultivate or till the ground. If you have an old King James version of John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the vine and my father is the husbandman. See, in ancient times, a husbandman was one who took care uh, of the, the farm, uh, took care of the gardening. It also meant a manager. Um, and in England today, another name for a husband is a manager. Our manager is a husband. 
So when you put these terms together, we understand that a husband is one who is called to cultivate, to till the ground, you might say, of the relationship with his wife. He's going to be one that keeps all the debris away. He's going to water the relationship with the word of God, water it with love. He's going to protect and provide a safekeeping place. His utmost concern is that she blossom, is that she bloom. So before we ever look at this word love, we see that the husband, a husband, is to be a spiritual manager of his home. And so think about this, man, and this is very important. The outcome of your marriage is chiefly the result of your gardening skills, your caring skills, your management skills, your relationship skills with your wife. Ron Weissman, he and his wife, Betty, I don't know how many marriage seminars they did here early on just prior to them retiring. I heard him say it many times, and it's always stuck with me. He, you see his sweet, precious wife, and he'd say, do you see, Betty? I made her that way. And I love that, and that's true. As the, so goes the husband, so goes the marriage. You see a woman that's broken down, falling apart, frumpy, angry all the time, most likely you can look at the husband. You see a wife that's happy and joyful in her responsibilities and her role, you can point to the husband. Now, I realize there are some exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, he made her that way. And so this is why the ancient Chinese proverb says, it's harder to lead a family than to rule a nation. That is very true because it's hard work. And we could put up a front in front of others, but what happens in the home, that's where our true colors shine. And it's either brilliant or blanch. The results inevitably become obvious to those around. She either becomes a bomb or she begins to bloom, you know? So how are we managing? How are we managing? What, what marriages need today is leadership. They need leadership. The family needs godly leadership. Too many men today have resigned to leave the leadership uh, to their wives. And so men today need to take a lead. They need to bring their marriages to godliness. And, and from time to time, you know, you hear people say, especially, of course, during an election year, you know, what we need is we need a Christian president. What a, what a difference it would make. If only we had a strong Christian in the White House. I say, if, if only we had strong Christians, men in every house, that'd make a bigger difference. Hey, one man can only make one influence, but I tell you what, you have many households across the United States being led by godly men. What a difference it would make. And so we need to take the godly lead and not leave that up to our wives. There was a man who died and went to heaven, and when he got up there, uh, he saw two lines and, uh, of men, and, and there was a sign over each one. And the first said, a sign said, men who were led by their wives, and it was thousands you could, for as far as the eye could see in this line. The other line said, men who led in their homes. And there was just one man in line. So the guy went up and says, man, how did you do it? He said, I don't know. My wife just told me to get in this line. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it is a godly man who will listen to the godly counsel of his wife, but we need to lead, man. We really do. And uh, one of the problems is just the way we lead. It's been said that men's leadership could be classified uh, in different categories like potatoes or taters. I mean, there are some men and they're just spectators, right? They're just spectators. They may work a job. They bring in money. They, they do a little bit of work around the house, but they only do what's necessary to survive, to stay above board. They don't seek to work on their marriage. Generally speaking, they're on autopilot. That's a spectator. Now, you also have some men that are agitators. And so they don't say nothing. They say plenty. But what they say is always negative. How come you don't do this? How come you don't do that? How come you don't cook my food this way? How come we don't do this? And, and on and on. And, and everything seems to stir up, you know, anger, an agitator. Of course, worse than that would be the husband who leads as a dictator, right? This is the guy that sees his home as his castle and his lazy boy as his throne, you know? And he just comes home and sits, plops down there and expects his wife to do everything. And that's disastrous. And that's why some women come to me and say, I wish you would make my husband a mashed potato, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm sick of him, you know, and that's, that's tragic. Now, it's, that's a little funny, but there's a lot of truth to those. God doesn't want us men to be spectators. He doesn't want us to be agitators or dictators or potentators, whatever it is. He, he wants us to be initiators. 
Um, he wants us to be motivators of divine love in the family. This is a divine privilege that God has given us to be the conduit by which he pours love into our marriage relationship. It, it is headship. And, and we think of the verse, and I, I read it last week. Let me read it to you again in Ephesians 5.23. It says, hey, the husband is the head of the wife. as also Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their husbands. Man, and a lot of men love hearing that, you know. And uh, they, in fact, some of you men are tempted just to rib your wife. Did you hear what he said? That was right out of the Bible. Did you hear that? Submit, you know. But here's the deal. Too much is given, much is required. You'd think that after, you know, Paul gives that mandate of wives submit to your husbands, then he'd say, now husbands, make sure you make sure they do that. You order around. You make sure she does that. But it doesn't say that. Some men get the idea that wives submit, husbands rule. But that's not what it says. It says, wives submit, husbands love. Love. Now, understand this. This is a radical concept as Paul was sharing this to this society. Ancient Greece, ancient Rome. Well, we, we know that there were no documents ever found. Anything like this that would say, husbands love your wife. There is none. You won't find one except for in the scriptures. You see, because women in that society were seen as commodities, pieces of property. You've got some cattle, you've got some sheep, and you've got a wife or two or three, you know? And um, you just make sure you treat them well, feed them good, and, and they'll get you some more kids, you know, some more commodities. And that's tragic. They were seen as property. So when people read this and, and Paul's saying, husbands, love your wives, wow, this was a whole new concept. Now, the word is agape, and you've probably heard that before. You've been a Christian for any length of time. Well, love your wives. Well, we, we only have one word in our English language for love. The Greeks had many. Uh, we say, you know, I love my dog. I love pizza. Oh, I love my wife. Now, depending upon how you say that word love lets us determine what kind of love it is. I mean, I hope you love your wife more than you love pizza, you know, but we only do have one word for love. But the Greeks had many ways to express love. There was eros. I eros you. That We get our English word erotic from it. It speaks of a, an intimate love, a sexual love. There was philea. I philea you. And that was friendship love. We get the term philanthropy from it. We get uh, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Then there was storge. That was the love that was family love, the love that comes from a parent to a child and a child to a parent. But it's interesting, God doesn't say in this passage, husbands, eros your wife, love her sexually, love her intimately. Well, that's part of a marriage union. It doesn't say, husbands, phileia your wives, treat her as a friend, though the fact is she ought to be your best friend. I know my wife, I can honestly say, she's my best friend. I love being with my wife all the time. He doesn't say, storge your wife, love her like you love your children. Again, that was the, that was the, ancient concept of a wife. No, he says, agape her, love her. Now, we'll talk a little bit more what that means, but we understand he is to love her. But before we even define it, I want you to understand that this word here is a present imperative. You say, what's that mean? All it means is this is something you're supposed to continually do. You, You might translate it continually love her. It's a lifelong mandate. It's not love her on your wedding night or love her the first year. Or love her until you get tired of her. Trade her in for a new model, you know. You could translate it, love her forever. Some men say, man, that sounds like a duty. Well, if you love her properly, it's really a delight. Now, most men start off good. No doubt about it. Most men start off good. Somehow you impress this gal that you're sitting next to today to marry you, which should ought to be amazing to you even to this day. But sometime after you got married, after the honeymoon, you thought, well, I hooked her on the line. I guess that was good enough, you know, and and that's it. And so instead of trying to satisfy her, it becomes status quo. Instead of romancing her, it's dead routine. But we're told here, love her continually. Men, your wives honestly are starving for romance. That's the way God geared them and, and created them. So they want romance. You say, Ron, I'm not the romantic type. Yeah, but you did something right for her to marry you. Somewhere down along the line, you were Mr. Romantic. 
And it was probably something very simple. She said, well, I, I'd like to go to the movies. And you're thinking, man, I'd love to go see some war movie or something. And it's some chick flick. And you know what you said? Oh, that sounds great. I'd love to do that. She said, oh, I'd like to go somewhere. And you're going, oh, man, good. We'll go to this one party over here. And she said, well, I'd love to go walk in the park just hand in hand. And you went, oh, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> You know, all of a sudden, you were Mr. Romance. She, you just loved everything she loved. Man, it was just bliss. It was great. So you know what you were? You were the salesman. And, and you know what? She, she, bought, she bought it. She purchased the package. Well, guess what, man? It's now time to service the product. She wants romance. How do you do that? You know what? I, I could spend the rest of the time just itemizing a hundred things that you can do. And you go to the local Christian bookstore, and I've bought lots of books over the years of things that you can do with your wife. There are lots of books like that that'll help you. Very, very practical. You know, go walk hand in hand in the park. You can do that. Cost you nothing. Go get it. Mean, my wife and I, one of our favorite things to do for so many years was just to go get an ice cream cone and go walk. You know, how it's not very expensive. I know it's getting more and more each year, but, you know, you work that into the budget. Go to the beach, you know. Uh, you know, one thing we didn't do is we'd go out to dinner stuff, but we never went to the movies. Uh, my wife said, that's not a date because all we do is sit by side by side and stare at a screen. You know, you need to have conversation going on. And so my wife and I go out on dates regularly, regularly, still do. And let me say this, if you're a young couple and you have young kids, that means without children, with no children, that means men take the initiative, get the babysitter. Work ahead, ahead of time, get the babysitter. I realize some of the moms might be saying, no, I want, no, it's not that I don't want, I want the kids to go. And then husband take the lead and say, no, we're gonna take a break. We need to be together alone. Have vacations together. I mean, as long as I can remember, there's never been a time we have. We have two vacations a year. One time always with our family, one time just my wife and I. We have to have that time. Men, you need to let her know she's special. Have you ever seen how, how, how some men are just fanatical over their car? If they got that special car, you know, they polish it, they pamper it, they, they protect it, you know. They serve it, service it regular to make sure it's in tip-top shape, you know. Sometimes they even refer to their vehicle as their little beauty. Some of these guys are driving around their car, and they're hoping that someone will actually look at them while they're driving in this car. And then they park it to a place, and it's protected. I don't want anybody to ding my little beauty, you know. That person obviously enjoys that vehicle. But the question I would say is, do you enjoy your wife that much? The truth is, the enjoyment we derive from something is directly related to the time and trouble we take to nurture it and care for it. So men, do you nurture and care for your wives like that? Well, let's define what this word agape means. This word love here means simply, you could translate it, unconditional love. It's not based on a feeling or an emotion, though it'll affect our emotions. Uh, probably the best way I like to think of it is in terms of John three sixteen: For God so loved, agape the world. That what? Well, feeling romantically inclined, he gave his life. Or feeling a warm fuzzy for us, God came and died for us, or knowing that we'd love him in return. So I, he loved because he knew we'd love back. No, none of those things. He gave. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Unconditional love. Now, that said, hold your finger here and make a left to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. So we're in Colossians. You got to pass Philippians and move to Ephesians. And I want to turn here because we really have more detailed uh, description of the role of a husband here. Just one verse in Colossians. We have several verses in Ephesians 5. Beginning in verse 25, it says, husbands, love your wives. That's just what we read in Colossians. But then it says, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for. That's what I just talked about. That is a sacrificial love. So that's the first thing you want to write down. I'm going to give you four S's. The first is sacrificial love, where Jesus willingly died for us, the bride. It's interesting, women are called to live in submission to their husbands. Husbands are supposed to be able to die for their wives. And you know what that means? Prior to the ultimate death, it's dying daily. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. We're making our way through the book of Colossians. The messages you hear come straight out of Calvary Houston in Friendswood, Texas. Pastor Ron will be thrilled for you to join us this Sunday. We have services at 9 and 11 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. 
come out and be with us for a time of worship, Bible study, and fellowship with others. Find more information at ltlradio.org. Would you be interested in supporting this ministry financially? You can do that easily at ltlradio.org. Just find the donate link. While you're at our website, you can look around and find all kinds of resources, additional teachings, download our mobile app, and even subscribe to our podcast. That way, you can listen to these teachings anywhere you go. Podcasts help bring solid messages to you in such a convenient way and time that works for you. Once again, go to ltlradio.org to learn more. If you'd like to let us know what you're learning from Colossians, you can call us at 281-648-5800. We'd even be happy to pray with you. Once more, that's 281-648-5800. Thanks for being a part of our listening audience today. We look forward to more thoughts from Pastor Ron as he continues on in Colossians, here on Large Than Life.